And the 2019 season has come to an end. Our Kansas City Royals are sitting at 80 and 82 at the end of the season. After 162 games, the Royals finish below 500 and still somehow only two games out of the playoff spot because the AL Central like I keep saying, was complete dog shit all year long. The Twins ended up winning the division with an 82-80 and 80 record, so they have an 82-80 and 80 record, which is by far the worst record out of all the playoff teams throughout all of MLB, and they're going to get a first-round buyer. They're not going to... They're going to skip the wildcard game when they should be having a wildcard game with a record like that, but they're not going to because the AL Central. And as far as how the rest of the league did, the AL East first place team was the Yankees. They were actually the second place team in the AL East last year, made the wild card, and then ended up winning the World Series all the way from the wild card. In the AL West, the Astros won that division. In the wild card, the teams were the Boston Red Sox and the Los Angeles Angels. In the National League, the East was the Washington Nationals. The Central was the Milwaukee Brewers. The West was the Los Angeles Dodgers. And then the wild card in the National League was the Chicago Cubs and the Colorado Rockies. As far as some of the league leaders goes for the 2019 season, the home run leaders in the American League were Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton, the Yankees' big bombers in their lineup. Judge had 47 to lead the league, and then Stanton was one behind him with 46. Also in the American League, something worth mentioning, Mike Trout had an absolutely insane wins above replacement at 11.1 war. Absolutely ridiculous, Mike Trout. In the National League, the home run race was Anthony Rizzo with 44, led the National League, and then Cody Bellinger behind him, and then the third place guy was Corey Dickerson of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Kelvin Herrera had 50 saves on the year for the Royals, that was second in the American League. Travis Jankowski, as our fourth outfielder, had 31 stolen bases, which somehow was top five, fourth in the American League. And then Danny Duffy had a 1.14 whip, which was eighth in the American League, and his 4.4 war was fifth in the American League. Now time to take a look at who won the awards in each league respectively. In the American League, the MVP, back-to-back -back MVPs, goes to Aaron Judge of the New York Yankees. The Cy Young goes to Verlander of the Houston Astros. The batting title is Miguel Cabrera, led the league in batting average. Rookie of the Year went to Vladimir Guerrero Jr. of the Toronto Blue Jays. And then the Gold Glove in right field, because of course, went to Mookie Betts. In the National League, the MVP was Anthony Rizzo of the Cubs, the Cy Young was Clayton Kershaw, the batting title was Joey Votto of the Reds, the Rookie of the Year was Ronald Acuna of the Braves, and then the Silver Slugger in right field in his first year with the San Diego Padres was Bryce Harper. As far as how our team did specifically, leading our team in home runs in this 2019 campaign was Jorge Soler, who had 26 bombs. He finished with a 767 OPS, so a pretty darn good year for Soler, definitely developing into the power bat that we want him to be. Jorge Bonifacio also hit 22 home runs with an 800 OPS and even 800. Mike Moustakish finished the year with the highest OPS on the team, a 9 at 12 OPS, and then 21 home runs. Would have definitely had more than that, but he did miss two months of the season with a torn finger ligament. Tommy Joseph was called up at the end of May, so he missed the first two months of the season as he was in AAA and then took over for Joe Maurer. Uh, when he took over at DH, and then Dozier was the first baseman. So Joseph, 23 home runs, a 778 OPS, so he's definitely proven that he's going to be the DH in the 2020 season to start the year. Whit Merrifield, a 771 OPS with 23 stolen bases, which was, I believe is top 10 in the American League. So he's definitely got some trade value, which we are going to use in this offseason as I get later on in this video. Andre Perez with an 8.46 OPS and 64 at bats. He was the backup catcher because we did end up DFAing Sandy Leone, I believe, in August or some point. So Andre Perez got some at bats and he definitely took advantage of those. Travis Jankowski, the 7.53 OPS, 31 stolen bases, the fourth outfielder. He was signed to a two year deal, so he'll be back for 2020. Hunter Dozier was definitely disappointing to end the year. He had like 12 home runs for the first two months of the season, ended up finishing with 17 home runs and a sub-700 OPS. Not what you want to see, but we are going to give him another shot in 2020, at least 
to see how he starts out the year and then we'll make a decision as we get I'll talk more about that as we get later on in this offseason video Salvador Perez just your Salvador Perez update he finished the year with a 6-5 6-5-1 OPS 18 home runs he's getting traded definitely we'll get into that later on in the video as well Ramon Torres did not hit at all this year he had a negative war uh, despite him being such an insane guy with the glove, he can't really be early early career Angelton Simmons because he's just so incredibly bad with the bat, a sub-600 OPS, and this year he's really going to have to prove he can hit. As far as the pitching side of things goes, Danny Duffy, you've already seen his stats. Jake Junis had a 3.62 ERA and 181 innings pitched, a 3.8 war, and he had a sub-2 walks per 9 ratio, so he is pretty good for us. Jesse Hahn had a really good season for us, a 3.36 ERA, 2.7 war. Tyson Ross, not so much, almost 5 ERA. He's not going to be getting uh, brought back. Jose Urena called up from AAA to replace Adam Conley about halfway through the year, and he ended up putting up a 3.12 ERA in 60 innings, and even got a 1.1 war in only 60 innings pitch. So Urena has definitely improved that he's going to be our number five starter in this 2020 campaign. As far as the bullpen goes, the highest war in the bullpen went to Rafael Montero, who struck out 156 batters in 120 and two thirds innings, got a 1.8 war as a reliever. Jake Jewell. Got 101 strikeouts, 124 and two-thirds innings pitched. Jose Torres was a solid lefty for us, had a .89 whip in 54 innings. Brandon Maurer had a solid year, but I doubt he's going to be back in 2020. Jeremy Jeffress, not the best year. He only pitched 12 innings, though, so you can't really judge him too hard. Trevor Rosenthal was very bad, walked way too many people. He was shut down for the, pet, the, like, the last two months of the season with shoulder inflammation. He is 1,000% not being brought back. And then Kelvin Herrera with his 50 saves, 58 strikeouts, and 58 innings pitched was our closer. Another solid year for him. And as far as who won the World Series in the 2019 campaign, it was the New York Yankees. Back-to-back -back World Series champions. They won in 2018. They won in 2019. They've won back-to-back. -back. They won in six games against the Milwaukee Brewers. And to kick off the offseason, the first move that we made was firing Ned Yost. His old school methods stuck in 1974 are no longer going to be on this team. Ned Yost has been relieved of his duties with one more year left in his contract, so he was fired. And replacing him is the... I'm not sure if he was in this. I know he is in real life, though. The third base coach for the... Cincinnati Reds, Billy Hatcher, he was a former player, played with the Astros, played with the Reds, I believe he played with the Red Sox for like a year or two as well. Billy Hatcher is now the manager of the Kansas City Royals. And taking a look at who we let go into free agency, Adam Conley was not brought back, Matt Harvey, sad to see him go, but he didn't really have a role here, and we just have way too many starting pitching depth that he's just not needed, and then he really didn't pitch well when he did get a shot in 2019. So he's gone, Tyler Collins, just the guy we don't really need, he's getting up there in years, and we have a bunch of other guys who could just easily be what he offered to the team as a depth outfielder. Brock Holt not being brought back, and then also Justin Grimm and Brandon Maurer. So we did let a lot of pitching walk, but we also signed a lot of pitching. I went into the offseason with relief pitching being the number one thing we needed to upgrade, and we did that. We went out and we signed Brad Brock, reliever to a one-year $4.6 million deal. He won the 2019 World Series with the Yankees. He was on that team, and now he's going to be on the Royals for the next year. And maybe we'll bring him back if he has a good year, but he is just going to be on a one-year prove-himself contract. Hector Rondon, we wanted to go out and get him because he had two solid years with the Astros in 2018 and 2019, but he ended up declining our offer and he ended up signing with the New York Yankees. Trevor Rosenthal, our former reliever, also signed with the New York Yankees, so I'm sure he'll put up like a 300 strikeout season of the bullpen somehow because the Yankees in this game are insane. Josh Fields, we ended up signing since we did not get Hector Rondon to a one-year, $4 million deal. The Los Angeles Dodgers reliever, 34 years old, just a one-year deal. He probably won't be back after one year, but he is a guy who can be a placeholder until we get some guys up through the system. 
Jose Torres, I thought, did a very good job for us as a Rule 5 draft last season, so we ended up re-signing him to a three-year, $4.7 million deal. Not too shabby of a deal. He's going to be a stud lefty for us in the pen. And then we also replaced Tyson Ross with a stopgap who could possibly be better than Tyson Ross. Felix Hernandez was not brought back by the Seattle Mariners, and we decided to hop on that. So Felix Hernandez, $6.2 million over this next year with the Kansas City Royals. He had a 2.74 ERA in 160 innings in 2019. So we're hoping he can replicate some of that production here in Kansas City in 2020 as he takes Tyson Ross's spot and that allows us to have Foster Griffin be the number six starter rather than just thrusting him right into the rotation on opening day or on the opening day roster. He's not going to start on opening day. You know what I mean by that. And now let's move on to the buttload of trades that I did this offseason. This was a very uncharacteristic offseason for me. I've done a lot, a lot more trades than I usually do. The first one we did was a minor one. Chesler Cuthbert was traded to the San Diego Padres in return for outfield depth Forrest all day. Cuthbert just really had no place on the roster. We have a lot of other guys who I would rather call up at a corner infield spot. Uh, especially once we get to the end of this offseason. You'll see there's even more reasons to not have Cuthbert on the team. But Cuthbert, no place on the team all day, is just a guy to have some with some depth outfield. I uh, can never have too much depth in the outfield. And plus, he was second in OPS in the AA Texas League last year, only behind our very own Ryan O'Hearn. So he's been a pretty good guy in the minor leagues, and we'll have him AAA this year, see if he maybe could possibly work his way out to the major leagues, but he's really just more of a depth guy to have on the roster. With Merrifield, what we did with him was we did a sign-and-trade. Signed him to a two-year deal worth $7.4 million over those two years, and we traded Whit Merrifield to the New York Mets in return for Familia, their former closer. He lost the closer job when they signed Sean Doolittle. He is now the their closer and they've acquired a bunch of other relief arms as well so he doesn't really have as big of a need in the bullpen as as he is in real life for the Mets where he's pretty much the only guy they have in the bullpen they have multiple guys who are pitching well for them in the bullpen this year and they desperately need a second baseman so we gave them with Merrifield in return we got Familia who has this year plus two more years left on his deal and then we also got a depth catcher in Mike Ullman who will be our third catcher the second the backup catcher being Andre Perez and then Mike Ullman will be our third catcher or starter in AAA. And then I've been saying I wanted to trade Mike Moustakis, get rid of Moustakis ever since this series started and we just haven't been able to do so because of how our records have been and just him being injured at the trade deadline. So Mike Moustakis was offered a qualifying offer again because you can do that in this game. He accepted it and I just decided to trade him with that one-year deal. So Mike Moustakis has been sent to the Cincinnati Reds in return for first base prospect Pavin Smith, outfield prospect Gustavo Rodriguez, who is a fake player, and then just as a throw-in, a starting pitcher, Nick Travieso. He's probably not going to be really anything in this, maybe just trade bait for another minor leaguer eventually down the line. He doesn't really have a role in our system, but he's just kind of in there. Pavin Smith and Gustavo Rodriguez, I'm not going to be showing you a lot on those guys because these guys are uh, going to be getting prospect profiles. So Smith, I can just tell you the first base product. First base prospect, B potential. He's very close to MLB ready. He'll probably be our first baseman at some point, even in this season. And then Gustavo Rodriguez is very, very raw, but he is an A potential. Once again, he will be getting a prospect profile somewhere along the line in this season. And then before we made our next couple of trades, we went out and signed a depth infield piece in TJ Bennett to a one-year $600,000 deal. He can play second, he can play third, he can play short. We mainly want him as a second baseman and a third baseman. He had a 1,000 OPS with the San Francisco Giants and five home runs in limited time with them in 2019. And he's going to be in AAA for us, but I mean, who knows? If Richard Rose doesn't really perform at second base, or we need somebody to be called up at a certain position, TJ Bennett could be an option. And since we added Pavin Smith to our first base depth in that Moustakis trade, we decided to go and trade two of our first basemen to the Philadelphia Phillies, Samir Dunez and Frank Schwindel. Dunez was a just decent power hitter. He's got some decent pop, a good glove. 
Uh, he could possibly have been a first baseman for us, but we don't. We definitely don't need him now. Now that Pavin Smith is here, Frank Schwindel, just a decent all-around first base bat. They're both being sent to the Philadelphia Phillies in return for Mark Leiter. Mark Leiter is going to be a depth relief pitcher for us. He went to Tom's River North High School in Tom's River, New Jersey. He ended up going to the New Jersey Institute of Technology and he was drafted in the 22nd round by the Phillies. Ended up playing for the Lakewood Blue Claws, which is also in New Jersey, the single A team for the Phillies. So he's just an all-around New Jersey guy and he's going to be a depth reliever for us. And He's also a pretty solid pitcher, if I do say so myself. And then Another huge trade that we did, probably the biggest one that we did, and the ones that are gonna have the one that is gonna have the most immediate impact is the Salvador Perez trade that I have been talking about pretty much all season long. Salvador Perez has been sent to the runner-up, the National League champion, Milwaukee Brewers. So Salvador Perez is now their catcher because the one position they were weak at was catcher. Uh, Manny Pena, who was an older, like, C-potential guy who just kind of got the job done, it wasn't really anything special, was their catcher, and now they have Salvador Perez there along with all the other stack positions they have. And then the thing that they had that I was looking, that really was the one position that I wanted to upgrade, even though we have Khalil Lee in the system, center field was definitely our weakest spot, I would say, so I wanted to solidify that spot with this trade. And the Milwaukee Brewers just have a boatload of center fielders. They've got Lorenzo Cain, they've got Keon Broxton, they've got Brett Phillips, and then they've got like three to four more like B to A potential guys who are just right there ready for the major leagues. And they can't play all these guys, so we ended up trading for Brett Phillips. I thought about doing Keon Brockton, Broxton at first, since he's older and he would be out sooner and then allow Khalil Lee to step in. But I decided that since we've seen how much playing time Jankowski gets as a fourth outfielder, that it wouldn't be too shabby if Khalil Lee was the fourth outfielder once Jankowski leaves in 2021. But for now, Brett Phillips is going to be our everyday center fielder. He is an A potential. He's got a great arm, an absolutely rocket attached to his arm. And then he's got a great fielding as well. He's going to be a good bat. He's a good bat as it stands right now. And he's just going to keep getting better as he is only 25 with an A potential. So we'll see what Brett Phillips can do with us because he's never gotten a chance to start in Milwaukee. But he is going to be having a chance to start every day with the Kansas City Royals. So we'll be seeing what he can do with us. We also got Cody Medeiros, who was a former first or a first round pick in 20. 2014, 12th overall, has never really done anything. He really hasn't been uh, what they would have hoped he would have been, so he's a C-potential guy, just kind of a throw-in prospect for us. And then Nathan Orff, who is just some depth uh, infielder and corner outfielder we can have for us. But Brett Phillips and Salvador Perez are the two main pieces of this trade. And then, like I said, with Khalil Lee, he was re-signed to a three-year deal, $2.3 million over those three years. Uh, he's going to be the fourth out for the next year once Janikowski leaves. He ended up last year in AAA because we ended up calling him up when Craig Gentry got hurt. Then he got sent back down. We called him up straight from AA, sent him down to AAA, and now he's going to be spending all of tr all of this year in AAA until the September call-ups rolls around, obviously, and then he'll be back up in the big leagues. But he is going to be the AAA center fielder for us this year. And then next year, he'll be taking over as the fourth outfielder because Jankowski's contract will be up and Khalil Lee will be primed to take over that spot after another year of developing through the, major, for the, through the minor leagues, and he'll only still be 22 years old. We also made an interesting pickup in the Rule 5 draft. Last year we picked up Jose Torres because we needed a lefty and really didn't like any of the lefties in free agency or the lefties in our system. So we picked up Jose Torres in the Rule 5 draft. This year we got Sean Gilmartin, who is in the minor league system of the Cardinals, and they just did not have him on the 40-man. So we got Sean Gilmartin now along with Jose Torres to be lefties in the bullpen. So Sean Gilmartin, we'll see what he can do as a lefty guy for us this year in 2020. And just a quick overview of the roster, we've got a couple of guys in AAA who have a bit of a tricky thing going with them. There's Brad Keller who's in AAA and he has all three of his minor league options used. So if he gets called up to the big leagues and then he gets sent back down, he has to clear waivers and every team will have a shot to pick him up. And Brad Keller definitely will not make it through that waiver. So we don't want to see that. So I don't want to be 
uh, dumb with calling him up. If I call him up, I don't want to be calling him up and then him be being sent down like a week later. If he gets called up again, it's going to be for good. Jeremy Jeffress, same situation, three out of three options. He's not that big of a loss if we lose, and he might not even get claimed because he is older. Mark Leiter, the guy we just traded for, he's in AAA, has the same situation. He's probably going to be in AAA most of the year for us, and then once we have all these one-year reliever contracts run up next next season, then Mike Mark Leiter will be able to take over in the bullpen for some of those guys. Luis Sessa, same deal with him, three out of three options. He was pretty solid in the bullpen in AAA last year. He had 77 strikeouts and 88 and two-thirds innings with a 1.73 ERA. So Sessa, he would be sad to see go, but he doesn't really have the biggest role in our organization. But I would like to keep him around if I can. Donnie Fitzgerald is now in AAA. He was in AA last year. He was second in the ERA in AA, third in whip, fifth in innings pitched, sixth in strikeouts, first in walks allowed, and now he's going to take those stats and hope to improve upon his game in AAA. Foster Griffin ended last season in AAA, didn't put up the best stats in AAA. He had a 4.22 ERA and 32 innings pitched, but he is going to get a full season in AAA this year. That is assuming that he doesn't need to be called up at some point to the big league level. And then there's also Josh Stalman, who in AA last year was first in wins, fourth in ERA, first in innings pitched, first in strikeouts. He was tied for eighth in walks allowed, which is good to see because that was one of his big issues, walking too many people. And then he was also first in whip. So after two seasons of dominating in AA, he has gotten the call to AAA, and that's where he's going to be in 2020. Michael Winnicka, he was a guy who was second in double-A in saves of 34, ended up starting for us at the end of 2019 in double-A, but he is back in that closer spot to start the double-A season and hopefully improve upon his ratings and eventually be either a stud reliever or a good number four, number five guy for us in the future. Jesus Castillo, who was a guy we got from the Alcides Escobar trade in Season 1 from the Angels, him and Jake Jewell. Castillo has 3-3 three to three options. Uh, he's in the 40-man, so he'll be getting called up in September call-ups, but I don't know how much of a future he has with this team, but it is worth mentioning that he is out of options. And then probably the most interesting guy in this entire system that we have is Vince Falvey, who is the absolutely insane bat that we have in AAA. He dominated in AAA last year, and he really cannot be held down in AAA for long. Like, if Tommy Joseph gets hurt, or if he even has, like, one bad month, I will have no issue just immediately calling up Falvey and then trading or sending down Joseph or whatever I made it to do with him. So, Falvey... He had 1,000 OPS in AAA, he had 24 home runs, he had 19 stolen bases, almost had a 2020 season, he was first in batting average, first in hits, first in doubles, second in triples, first in home runs, first in RBI, first in runs, first in OBP, first in slugging, and first in OPS in the Pacific Coast League last year. So he kind of had a good year, so he's not going to be in AAA for very long. Hunter Dozier is still our first baseman for now, but we don't know how long he's going to stick there because if he has like a bad two months or something, then Pavin Smith will probably end up end up taking his place. I know I'm mentioning Pavin Smith a lot with actually showing his attributes. He is going to be the first prospect profile you see in 2020, so he'll be up in like, I don't know, like two, three days. You'll see a prospect profile for him. Richard Rose is the leadoff guy in the major leagues now, starting second baseman. He had a 360 OBP in AAA last year, which was 10th in the Pacific Coast League. Hopefully he can translate that to the big league level. Jerickson Profar is also now our utility guy, now that Brock Holt is no longer on the team. So Profar, he's the utility guy. He had a great year in AAA last year with 6th in triple in uh, OPS with an 818. And then he also had a great year in 2018 with the Rangers coming off the bench for them. So hopefully he can have another good year for us as the super utility guy. Ramon Torres is still our starting shortstop, but he is definitely going to have to prove that he can hit. If he can't prove that he can hit this year, then he's probably going to lose his job to somebody in our system. We have got a bunch of guys who could take over at that spot, and he's probably going to lose that job if he proves that he if he if he doesn't hit this year. So, big year for Ramon Torres to prove that. Miguel Andujar is our starting third baseman. He didn't have the best year in AA last year, but it also wasn't the worst. He was 10th in hits. He was 8th in runs. 
Uh, he's getting called up straight to the major leagues, and uh, we'll see how he does. Obviously, we're not going to expect the guy to hit 300 home runs in a season, but uh, I'd like to see him do something at, at third base, but if he doesn't, then we've got a couple guys who could take over that position, and then he'll just get sent on a AAA and hopefully progress down there. Also, Travis Janikowski, like I mentioned, is the fourth outfielder this year. This is the last year in his deal, so once he is done with this season, then Khalil Lee will be up as the fourth outfielder as he is in AAA to start the 2020 season. So with that being said, it's going to wrap things up here for this edition of the Kansas City Royals franchise, the offseason edition. We have finished 2019, done the offseason, made our trades, a bunch of trades, and now it's time to move on to the 2020 season. I've been your host, Jerseyborn, and I'm saying goodbye. So I remember when we were driving, driving in your car, speed so fast it felt like I was drunk. City lights day out before us, and your arm felt nice wrapped around my shoulder, and I, I had a feeling that I belonged. I, I had a feeling I could be someone, be someone, be someone.